How possible is it to draw nature culture distinctions? This kind of question is usually at the heart of many ends of our knowledge about what we propose reality to be. If we say a thing is entirely the result of some natural progression, then our view can be very apathetic quite easily. If something is found in nature, we just accept it without further question most of the time. We say that it's just so. However, if we find something in experience and reality which indicates that it came from culture, that is, it is not the result of natural evolutionary progression, we may at times find them harder to accept and bring into the discussion a factor of how true and false, right and wrong they are, when all that is going on is a different kind of evolution and progress, one that concerns constructs that are not natural but contingent, that is accidental or dependent on other relational elements from lines of struggle that cannot be reduced to natural causes. The priority of conception changes, not the value of moral or truth claims. Let's take incest taboo for example. If we ask whether or not incest prohibition is natural or cultural, we may immediately rush straight into the response with a case for it being natural. So far so good. But if you take a closer look at incest, you will find plenty of cases of incest being a not necessarily bad thing in evolutionary terms at all. Mice and rats, for example, are well documented as being very incestuous, and the threat of extinction of many species may lead them to inbreeding. Why is this? Well, it diversifies the gene pool. So this means that adaption to the environment is much more likely, not out of choice, bear in mind. If there are more diverse genes to choose from, then the likelihood of survival increases. So from an evolutionary perspective, incest actually makes perfect sense in terms of survival. But this is a touchy subject, but it's also a very brilliant example of how nature culture priority can become very blurry, and what we think is natural is actually a cultural norm, nothing more than an agreed upon convention. We can see the same response in aristocrats, especially in royal families. As consorts were sometimes harder to find, the gene pool grew smaller and smaller to the point that all European royal families were related to each other. The Habsburgs were notorious for inbreeding, for example. Check out this Wikipedia article, which just barely scratches the surface of royal inbreeding. So where do we draw the line now between nature and culture? Naturalism can only empirically document what actually survived and how it did it. Evolution doesn't prescribe a moral code and it doesn't come ready-made out of natural progression. Culture on the other hand is made of conventions, rules which usually form as customs. The work of Dr. Robert Sapolsky, an evolutionary biologist, once more provides evidence for the very limits of naturalism and what it can possibly explain. At some point we have to take into account social cultures which arrive out of the blue, which are contingent, in other words they could have been very different. In emergence of a peaceful culture in wild baboons, quote, for most animal species, Behavioural attributes are largely the product of interactions between genes and environment, with behavioural patterns preserved by natural selection. But when it comes to primates, including humans, a good deal of behaviour is learned. Primates exhibit a wide range of behaviours, not just among species but also among populations and even individuals. In this Public Library of Science article, there is a pack of baboons that were wild and were once led by some very dominant and violent males. This was because their presence was needed during a very rough period where times were much harsher. 
but once the dominant males were in charge, they didn't budge even when the environment changed, they didn't change their way of acting, and this was actually putting their survival at risk where it didn't before. It was only when they sadly died of poisoning that things changed. The other baboons created a new, much more peaceful society and culture and improved their chances of survival in the wild by doing so. Primatologists characterise these behavioural differences as cultural traits since they arise independent of genetic or environmental factors and are not only shared by a population, though not necessarily a species, but are also passed on to succeeding generations. So they don't fit into the general way inheritance works in Darwinian terms. But is there another way in which traits can be passed on, in the way that is described here? As we are talking about cultural traits, we can talk about the idea that an organism can pass on characteristics that it has acquired during its lifetime to its offspring, also known as heritability of acquired characteristics or soft inheritance. This is also known as Lamarckism. Back to incest, however. As we have seen here, the line between culture and nature becomes blurry and the necessity for both a naturalistic science and a science of culture, which is also known as a social science and the humanities, both have equally valid reasons to offer explanations for phenomena which cannot be reduced to natural progression alone. Incest taboo is a cultural taboo, it is a moral taboo, which puts it right into the language used for ethics and culture and philosophy, not nature. Again, this isn't an argument for or against the righteousness or outright wrongness of incest. I personally think it's gross if humans do it, but as much as it grosses me out, when it comes to being truthful about incest prohibition, it's actually not set in stone at all and is something that was inherited in the Lamarckian cultural sense and not part and parcel with genetic inheritance. We could say it is performative. It has the appearance of being naturalized, as if it makes perfect natural sense. But in fact, it is made by social interaction and incorporation. An act which was repeated over and over again enough times for it to become more solid. Which is to say, it is reified as a structure. Feminists, such as Judith Butler, look at the work of Claude Levi-Strauss, a structural anthropologist, who looks at the prohibition of incest as actually being the initial cause of patriarchy, or rather where it first materialises. This is because the law is always in the account of the father. The prohibition comes from the language of the symbolic order in the account of the father, which slices the continuity between mother and child. Along with the prohibition comes the cancellation and sublimation of the mother and woman. As incest prohibition is a cultural phantasm, a performative act of speech, she demonstrates how roles cannot be reduced to essentialism and how culture can predominate over nature. Stop and think about how you instantly rejected the idea that nature could not possibly lead to prohibition of incest on its own. You honestly cannot tell nature from culture at this moment. Levi Strauss sees incest prohibition as the rejection of endogamy and advocation of exogamy. This extends Marcel Mauss's theory of the gift, whereby women were the gifts to be given to other tribes exogamistically. This is what forms the basis for Butler's theory of the dependent origination of patriarchy with the prohibition of incest, where during the law of the account in the name of the father, inbreeding is prohibited and marrying outside the tribe is encouraged. The women are only the extension of the male desire. Margaret Mead, when asking the Arapesh, was told by the tribe, quote, No, we don't sleep with our sisters. We give our sisters to other men, and other men give us their sisters. 
While the case for the universality of incest prohibition was the aim of Levi Strauss and Mead, Judith Butler certainly does well to show the social construction of patriarchy as emerging from the prohibition of incest and how cultures can predominate over nature to the point where we can't get under culture as we are layered with culture with more culture and more culture historically and conceptually always growing on the outside and never from a pure source within all origination is dependent when it comes to culture and traits which can be passed on during lifetimes to offspring in conclusion then we can with common sense think that some ways of thinking and acting are completely natural the incest taboo the prohibition of inbreeding with one's closest relatives is something which is not present in evolution and some animals could not have survived imminent extinction if they had not diversified their genes through inbreeding this includes certain human groups in higher societal positions of power Lamarckian inheritance may not as yet be able to explain genetic traits being inherited some propose epigenetics as a way in which to do this but it certainly offers a useful context and conceptual tool for cultural and social change. Cultural traits can be generated during a lifetime and passed on to their offspring. Incest taboo is such a provocative topic that it truly highlights how embroiled we are in our cultures. Incest prohibition not only prevents and limits sexual activity with relatives, but it dependently originates the sublimation and cancellation of women's identity as a means of keeping peaceful relations and in terms of Butlerian feminism. It is the melancholic loss, the moment in children's psychological development where the language of the father introduces patriarchy and closes off the continuity between the mother and the child. This doesn't mean that we should prohibit the prohibition of incest and none of this essay should be taken as an argument for or against incest. Rather, it is to show how culture can take priority over nature and can have very unexpected, that is contingent, out of the blue, accidental occurrences that were not predictable from a purely naturalistic perspective.